it's Jasper, and today we are reading chapter seven of The Princess and the Goblin. <laughs> Dropped it. Pairing with today's story, I will be having a great, big, glorious cup of coffee. Pour yourself something yummy to drink. Relax, enjoy, and cheers. Chapter 7 The Mines. Curdy went home whistling. He resolved to say nothing about the princess for fear of getting the nurse into trouble. For while he enjoyed teasing her because of her absurdity, he was careful not to do her any harm. He saw no more of the goblins and was soon fast asleep in his bed. He woke, though, in the middle of the night and thought he heard curious noises outside. He sat up and listened, then got up and, opening the door very quietly, went out. When he peeped around the corner, he saw under his own window a group of stumpy creatures whom he at once recognized by their shape. Hardly, however, had he begun his one, two, three, when they broke asunder, scurried away, and were out of sight. He returned laughing, got into his bed, and was fast asleep in a moment. Reflecting a little over the matter in the morning, he came to the conclusion that, as nothing of the kind had ever happened before, they must be annoyed for him, for interfering to protect the princess. By the time he was dressed, however, he was thinking of something quite different, for he did not value the enemy of the goblins in the least. As soon as he had breakfast, he set off with his father for the mine. They entered the hill by a natural opening under a huge rock where a little stream rushed out. They followed its course for a few yards when the passage took a turn and sloped steeply into the heart of the hill, with many angles and windings and branchings off, and sometimes with steps where it came upon a natural gulf. It led them into deep the hill before they arrived at the place where they were at present digging out the precious ore. This was of various kinds, for the mountain was very rich with the better sort of metals. With flint and steel and tinderbox, they lighted their lamps then fixed them on their heads and soon were hard at work with their pickaxes and shovels and hammers. Father and son were at work near each other, but not in the same gang. The passages out of which where the ore was dug, they called gangs. For when the load or the vein of an ore was small, one miner would have to dig away, alone in a passage no bigger than give him just room enough to work, sometimes in uncomfortable cramped positions. If they stopped for a moment, they could hear everywhere around them some nearer, some farther off, the sounds of their companions, burrowing away in the directions of the insides of the great mountain, some boring holes in the rock in order to blow it up with gunpowder, others shoveling the broken ore into baskets to be carried to the mouth of the mine, others hitting away with their pickaxes. Sometimes, if the miner was in a very lonely part, he would hear only a tap tapping no louder than that of a woodpecker, for the sound would come from a great distance off through the solid mountain rock. The work was hard at best, for it was very warm underground, but it was not particularly unpleasant, and some of the miners, when they wanted to earn a little money for a particular purpose, would stop behind the rest and work all night. But you could not tell night from day down there, except for feeling tired and sleepy, for no light of the sun ever came into those gloomy regions. Some, who had thus remained behind during the night, although certain there were none of their companions at work, would declare the next morning they had heard every time they halted for a moment to take breath, a tap, tap, tapping all around them, as if the mountain were then more full of miners than ever during the day, and some in consequence would never stay overnight, for all knew those were the sounds of the goblins. They worked only at night, for the miners' night was the goblins' day. Indeed, the greater number of miners were afraid of the goblins, for there were strange stories well known among them of the treatment some had received whom the goblins had surprised at their work during the night. The more courageous of them, however, among them Peter Peterson and Curdy, who in this took after his father, had stayed in the mine all night again and again, and although they had several times encountered a few stray goblins, had never yet failed in driving them away. As I have indicated already, the chief defense against them was verse, for they hated verse of every kind, and some kinds they could not endure at all. I suspect they could not make themselves and that's why they disliked it so much. At all events, those who were most afraid of them 
were those who could neither make verses themselves nor remember the verses that other people made for them, while those who were never afraid were those who could make verses for themselves. For although there were certain old rhymes which were very effectual, yet it was well known that a new rhyme, if of the right sort, was even more distasteful to them, and therefore more effectual in putting them to flight. Perhaps my readers may be wondering what the goblins could be about, working all night long, seeing they never carried up the ore or sold it. But when I have informed them concerning what Curdie learned the very next night, they will be able to understand. For Curdie has determined, if his father would permit him, to remain there alone this night, and that for two reasons. First, he wanted to get extra wages in order that he might buy a very warm red petticoat for his mother, who had begun to complain of the cold mountain air sooner than usual this autumn. And second, he had just a faint glimmering of hope of finding out what the goblins were about under his window the night before. When he told his father, he made no objection, for he had great confidence in his boy's courage and resources. I'm sorry I can't stay with you, said Peter, but I want to go and pay the person a visit this evening. And besides, I've had a bit of a headache all day. I'm sorry for that, father, said Curdy. Oh, it's not much. You'll be sure to take care of yourself, won't you? Yes, father, I will. I'll keep a sharp lookout, I promise you. Curdy was the only one that remained in the mine. About six o'clock, the rest went away, everyone bidding him good night and telling him to take care of himself, for he was a great favorite with them all. Don't forget your rhymes, said one. No, no, answered Curdy. It's no matter if he does, said another, for he'll only have to make a new one. Yes, but he mightn't be able to make it fast enough, said another, and while it was cooking in his head, they might take a mean advantage and set upon him. I will do my best, said Curdy. I'm not afraid. We all know that, they returned and left him. In this chapter, I'd like to talk about the two things we see focused on and developed concerning the character of Curdie, and that is his kindness and courage. We see the kindness of Curdie displayed a few ways in this chapter. The first way is in reference to Ludie, whom the narrator notes that although Curdie enjoyed teasing her because she kind of said outrageous and offensive things, he didn't want to cause her any harm. And so we see his kindness in that he understands there's a difference between kind of teasing someone playfully and getting them into big trouble. If he were to mention anything about Ludi and the princess out in the woods, Ludi would lose her job and perhaps, given the medieval setting, her life. Another way we see Curdie's kindness is in reference to his mother. We find out that he has been working late in the mines so that he can afford his mother a new petticoat. And what I like about what the narrator says is it's not just a new petticoat, but a new red petticoat. Because I have the feeling that Curdie has decided in his mind what is his mother's best and favorite color. And he's maybe been paying attention to these things because he has heard her commenting, you know, that it's getting colder this autumn. And, and the narrator makes a point to say he's noticed that she started commenting this earlier, meaning he notices every year when she comments about the cold. And this year he notices she's commenting earlier. And so he thinks, I'll work a few extra hours so I can get her a nice red petticoat. Another way that we see Curdie's kindness is in reference to his father and the other miners. The way that he talks back and forth with them is, is kind and friendly. And when his father says the whole thing about, you know, I'm sorry I can't stay in the mines with you tonight, I've got a bit of a headache, Curdie doesn't even say anything about the fact that he's going to be left alone in these goblin mines. Instead, he's like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that you've got a headache, Dad, that, that's not nice where he should maybe be thinking about himself and his own safety, he's thinking about other people. And so these are three ways that we see the kindness of Curdie developed. Now the courage of Curdie is something we also see in a few different ways. Now this is something we have been introduced to in the chapter prior as we saw his courage with facing the goblins, and this is something repeated at the beginning of this chapter. When he hears something at his window and he's tucked up in his bed, my initial thought was, if I am a child and I'm tucked in my bed, like as an adult, if I'm tucked in my bed and I hear something out by the window, my initial thought is not, 
I'm gonna go outside, see what it is, and if it's goblins, I'll scare them away. My thought is like, stay in the bed and hide and like head, you know, put your covers over your head. Uh, but Curdy shows courage. He gets out of his bed, sees it's goblins, and starts singing his song, and they scurry off. And then he goes to bed and sleeps soundly. I would, I would just be freaking out. We see Curdy's courage again in reference to what the narrator says about Curdy and his father. That unlike many of the other miners who are rightfully afraid of mining at night for fear of the goblins, and apparently some horrible stories about what goblins have done when they come upon miners, Curdy and his father aren't afraid and they mine at night very often. Further, we see Curdy isn't afraid to even mine by himself, that his regular work is done in these narrow pits all by himself, and when his father needs to go home and all the miners need to go home, Curdy is absolutely fine with staying and mining by himself, on top of the secret purpose of doing so so he can find out things about the goblins. So his courage is twofold. He's not afraid to stay in the mines, and he's also not afraid to spy on the goblins. And something I love about the courage that is in Curdie is that we see the source clearly coming from his father, who has modeled this courage, and further, who, who has affirmed Curdie in his own strength. His father knows that he can leave Curdie in the mines because he, the narrator says, trusts Curdie's courage and resourcefulness. I especially like the dialogue that we see at the very end in which the miners are kind of going like, well, make sure you know your verses. And he's like, ah, you know, I will, I will. And they're like, well, you know, sometimes you think you can make one up, but you, they can get you. So just be careful. And he's like, I will, I will, I will. And then he finally says, you know, like, I'll be careful. I'm not afraid. And the miners all answer back, we know. And that is just precious because again, Curdy is courageous, not just because it's something he's built in himself, but it's clearly something that's been built in himself by his community that affirms his quality. As always, guys, I hope whatever you've been drinking has been good, that the conversation and story have been a fair match. Cheers and cheers. in Curdy, Curdy's quality of courage, Curdy's quality of courage, Curdy's quality of courage, Curdy's quality of courage. Just try saying that like a bunch of times. Just try to say it one time. Curdy's quality of courage, 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 courage. I keep saying carriage instead of courage because I'm saying Curdy and quality first. This is science, right? Thank you.